talk about Abraham Accords, uh, which are aimed at normalizing relations uh, between Israel and uh, two Arab nations, that is Bahrain and United Arab Emirates. Uh, we will uh, try and understand what exactly are the contours of these uh, agreements and why exactly are they so important. And for more on this, uh, we are joined by a distinguished panel of guests. Let me first uh, Introduce them to you, beginning with former Ambassador Vin Gupta. We also have with us uh, Professor A.K. Pasha from uh, Center of West Asian Studies in Jawaharlal Nehru University and Mr. K.B. Prasad, Senior Associate Editor at The Tribune. Let me begin with you, Mr. Prasad, uh, since uh, you also uh, you know, keep a tab on all these uh, developments. Uh, what exactly are we talking about uh, when we mention Abraham Accords and why exactly are they important? Uh, in the White House, in the presence of President Trump, uh, was brokered uh, largely by America, and essentially two bilateral deals, uh, agreements, one with the Israel, with the UAE, United Arab Emirates, and the other was the UA, uh, Israel and Bahrain. Now, these agreements will establish, uh, the aim is to establish uh, diplomatic ties, and the embassies uh, uh, being located in both the countries, exchange of ambassadors, cooperation, they uh, promise to work together. Uh, the idea is they'll be working in various sectors. These sectors include trade and tourism, healthcare, and security. Now, so that's a very important segment of this because security is one area where uh, everybody knows the region is quite volatile and there are many conflicting uh, issues that uh, are always there. Uh, though it has been called as a peace deal, but uh, one thing essential is, is, is that the, what is important is that the deal that came in that, in that region, the West Asia region as we call it, is after almost a quarter of a century because the last time, the, the first time the deal was uh, was between Egypt and Israel in 1975, post Camp David, everybody remembers that. Mm -hmm. And then of course came in 1994 with Jordan. And so to almost after 94, uh, the, Israel had no diplomatic relations with anybody in the Arab world. So this is a very significant move in that direction because two countries uh, and who are also important in the GCC, uh, well, UAE among them, now will have uh, uh, diplomatic ties and take the thing forward. So I think Israel, it opens up a, a, a new avenue in that region. Okay. Okay, let me bring in Ambassador Gupta here. Ambassador Gupta, uh, your views specifically on, on, on these accords in terms of, uh, is this setting up of a stage for uh, some larger, you know, uh, state of affairs when we, we, which we can see from here onwards? Uh, because as uh, Mr. Prasad was pointing out, after Egypt and Jordan, and that too, after almost a quarter of a century, these are the only two Arab nations with which uh, Israel now has a peace agreement. Well, it is a very major development. And I would say that uh, this is uh, moving forward in the direction of uh, some sort of settlement, uh, uh, if at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, it has been brokered by America. There is no doubt about it. Uh, what is also very clear is that even though no agreement has been signed uh, by Saudi Arabia itself, uh, they are very clearly behind it. Because without Saudi Arabia's blessing, um, a country like Bahrain uh, could not have uh, uh, you know, gone ahead with such uh, uh, a dramatic development. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, if you look at the entire picture, uh, it is uh, a, a rehabilitation of Israel in a certain sense, and also a very uh, distinct message to Palestinians that uh, this approach of all or nothing will not work. Okay. You know, in today's times, all or nothing um, doesn't work in any which way that you look at. Uh, uh, you have to move with the times. And uh, there, are, there are certain maximalist uh, demands that Palestinians have always insisted on that in all likelihood they will not be able to get. So I think what is important is that the region is moving uh, towards uh, normalization. And uh, Israel has always had existential problems. In 1948, when Israel was created, mm -hmm. a large part of the world was against uh, the creation of Israel. And also the Arab countries reje rejected it. Uh, and Israel was attacked, as you know. Uh, so I think since that time, 
they have suffered uh, existential uh, threat. Uh, and I think if they are accommodated, if they are accepted, this is, this is really an acceptance by um, uh, countries in the region. Uh, firstly, as you said, uh, as Mr. Prasad said, uh, with Egypt, and uh, then with Israel, and then of course many other countries um, uh, began to uh, develop relationship. Mm -hmm. I distinctly remember, in fact, I, I went to Israel to open the Indian embassy in 1992, shortly after the Chinese had established relations. And uh, this question was often raised, and that was a good time for uh, the peace process. So I hope very much that uh, once Israel is given uh, a little feeling of comfort, they will then, uh, which is also part of the agreement, that they will also desist from uh, uh, undertaking uh, illegal activities in the uh, occupied territories. Okay. Uh, they have been wantonly going on with the annexation of territories, which is not right. Because as much as you accept Israel's right to exist uh, in a peaceful environment, you must also accept the right of Palestinians to a state of their own. Okay. So I think this will impact on Israel's thinking, and I hope very much that uh, you know we can revert back to Rabin's times and uh, move forward with the peace process. Okay. We uh, we very much need a peace process. Okay. Indeed, a uh, uh, peace process is uh, very much needed out there, Professor Pasha. Uh, if you could, uh, you know. Uh, Show us the larger picture here, specifically, you know, uh, is this one step further ahead in normalization of the West Asia or uh, ensuring that the peace does exist in that region? Uh, you know, the friction between all these nations uh, seemingly will gradually pass away. Yeah, this could be seen as a uh, baby step uh, in that uh, larger picture, uh, which which uh, has uh, uh, eluded uh, you know, peace in this region for over a century, particularly after uh, 48 and more specifically after Sadat uh, concluded the peace agreement in 1979. Many thought that the largest Arab country uh, recognizing uh, Israel and signing the peace treaty would usher an era of peace, but uh, many were disappointed uh, uh, because uh, we saw the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 82 uh, and uh, subsequently the other developments. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, normalization uh, has to be seen in the background of three or at least four uh, major issues. One is uh, the new assertive uh, foreign policy of the UAE which has seen active role in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, in Egypt, uh, and uh, elsewhere. And, uh, and also their ongoing confrontation or uh, Cold War with uh, Iran in the background of occupation by Iran of three of their islands. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, you have uh, President Trump uh, seeking re-election and uh, his uh, uh, problems with the COVID pandemic uh, and uh, challenge by the Democrats. Uh, so he needed a diplomatic victory uh, sort. Uh, thirdly, uh, the Israelis also, uh, under Benjamin Netanyahu, as you are aware, he is facing a corruption scandal. He is under an inquiry. And also his uh, handling of the pandemic uh, and the weak and vulnerable coalition uh, government. So all of this put together, the three... Uh, uh, parties, four parties uh, had their own uh, uh, compelling reasons uh, uh, to look at uh, this region afresh. Mm -hmm. uh, given uh, the, the, the assertive role of Iran, the newly uh, uh, emboldened uh, Turkish President Erdogan, and uh, what they have been trying to do to uh, shore up uh, uh, Hezbollah to shore up the Palestinian cause, uh, sidelining Saudi Arabia and the Arab countries. So in that way, you know, one has to see the domestic compulsions of these three states, uh, plus America, then the regional uh, players who are active uh, now, uh, who are trying to sideline the older uh, players. So it's a mixture of domestic, regional and global uh, factors which have brought about this at uh, this uh, juncture 
but I would still view this as uh, a baby step uh, because many more steps have to be taken uh, uh, to see this region uh, enjoy peace, security, and stability. Okay. And after all, the Israelis now have realized that you know, uh, if America is in a withdrawal mood, they have to uh, look afresh uh, as being part of West Asia and also offer uh, uh, what they have done, that is postponing the annexation of uh, part of the West Bank, which Netanyahu had uh, threatened. Okay. So, uh, although he has not given up uh, his claim mm -hmm. over the West Bank uh, is his settlements. Okay. Uh, Professor Pasha, you mentioned how, you know, uh, uh, things did not, does not uh, uh, become very, very uh, fruitful after the peace deal was signed with Egypt in 79 as well. So in that context, uh, do you see uh, other Arab states also following suit here after Bahrain and United uh, Arab Emirates, UAE? You see, the American president did mention five uh, countries uh, which are lining up. Probably he has in mind uh, uh, Oman, uh, Sudan, uh, Morocco, or uh, even Qatar uh, in the lineup. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't see the, uh, the possibility uh, very soon because uh, uh, you see the ground reality hasn't changed much. In fact, uh, it has given additional ammunition to Iran, to Turkey, to Hezbollah, to Hamas and uh, other critics. Uh, and also the vulnerability of the Israeli government is also there whether it can really sustain uh, the kind of uh, promises they have made. And uh, we are not sure whether uh, Trump will uh, get re-elected uh, given the domestic uh, uh, developments in America. So in that okay. way, you see uh, the, the, the uh, fallout, uh, which uh, peace dividends, as they call, uh, is, uh, you know, has to be seen in the background of uh, economic and security. But the larger threat which uh, one might uh, he is the ganging up of Israel, Bahrain, and UAE, and the American military armada in the Gulf against Iran, in the background of American threat to reimpose the UN sanctions after the Security Council rejected their bid to have the arms embargo extended. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, uh, there is also this threat perception which is growing, that earlier uh, Obama had prevented uh, Israel from attacking uh, uh, Iran's nuclear facilities. But now uh, Israel has reached uh, the shores uh, virtually of Iran, and it will be much more easier uh, uh, for Israel to accomplish its uh, goals, uh, given the preoccupation of the American administration okay. until the election. So there, there is this threat also, and also the olive uh, branch, uh, which flows from the Accords uh, normalization in terms of peace, uh, sorry, the economic dividends for all the three countries. Okay, okay. Mr. Prasad, uh, would you agree with uh, Professor Pasha there that for uh, the peace dividends of accords like these, uh, a lot more follow up work needs to be done from both sides? Yeah, I think uh, what he said, in fact, if you read a couple of newspaper uh, reports or expert opinions, and uh, even in Israeli press or people who study Israel very closely, they wonder uh, the speed at which the accord was uh, signed because they also believe that a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, probably, as Professor Pasha put it, this was partly dictated by the fact that the Amer American president is going for election. He's seeking, President Trump is seeking re-election. And this is a very big, uh, uh, you know, it's a diplomatic uh, price for him before uh, the elections, uh, Americans vote on November 3rd. Mm -hmm. Whether this foreign policy does make a change because Israel has a big support uh, in in the U.S. and has a very influence uh, across American politics. That having been said, I think what's also most important here is to know, as Professor Pasha also indicated, uh, Ambassador Gupta also, uh, we all know it's an American broker thing, but what happens to the Arab Peace Initiative? That was the fulcrum of 2002, uh, because the Arab countries had collectively decided to move forward for the, the Palestinian movement of nationhood. Mm -hmm. Now, will that be affected? Because uh, now we have uh, two countries joining. And as uh, uh, President Trump indicated, there are three, four more or five countries ready to go in for such thing. So the collective uh, thrust behind Palestinian, uh, what happens to that? Is it okay. crumbling? Uh, these are some issues I think will be looked at the realm of future. Okay. Okay. 
Am I Gupta? Yes. So, in in your views uh, specifically, a lot more needs to be done, as both uh, Mr. Prasad and Professor Pasha is pointing out. It can't be just uh, one peace accord uh, signed, and perhaps we can assume that uh, the peace uh, dividends will start coming in because we have uh, this example of uh, accord with Israel, uh, with with Egypt in '79, with then Jordan in 1994, but then things went uh, awry from there as well. Well, it's a it's a revolution. and uh, i think it is uh, it has very far reaching implication when you look at the the broader context uh, if you recall uh, oic was set up mm -hmm. you know the the islamic countries were solidly uh, joined together in their opposition to israel uh, and that is why oic was set up after 67 uh, now that i think the unity this accord has not punctured it it has already started getting punctured in the last few years you see uh, the division between the shia shia and the sunni you know that kind of conflict has brought about uh, a considerable weakening of um, the islamic front as it were against uh, israel uh, and uh, this accord obviously uh, you know puts the uh, nail on the coffin in a sense uh, now uh, whether this will go on uh, yes uh, america has put pressure and if america continues to put pressure uh, you know more and more countries will uh, join mm -hmm. uh, as uh, other speakers have pointed out i think the saudi arabia very strongly and that coalition that has developed in these uh, in, the, in the middle east uh, against iran and i think that is working on uh, uh, developing or uh, accommodating israel uh, so i think uh, one has to see it in that context another okay. very important thing is that the islamic countries were so far uh, arab countries all of uh, they were united on the position that palestine must get its pre 67 boundaries that israel must retreat to the pre 67 uh, and i think anyone who is familiar with the um, uh, politics and dynamics in the middle east i've served both in israel and egypt and i can tell you that that, that always uh, seemed like a very unrealistic um, um, you know demand mm -hmm. if i if i could use that term uh, likewise the, the demand for um, the palestinians to get back to, to uh, you know their their uh, home um, as in haifa and things it those those things were not going to happen israel was also not going to vacate the entire uh, jerusalem mm -hmm. uh, so i think uh, some of these uh, Uh, you know the the arab countries themselves will begin to weaken their position of support okay. for palestine and i think what will emerge is a more realistic uh, you know contours of what could em finally emerge as a solution okay uh, but a lot of work is required obviously uh, you know this is not going to end here and my own sense is that in the next whether whether it's before the elections or after the elections in america i think we will see uh, at least a few more countries oman is um, almost ready to uh, uh, come forward uh, some other arab countries might come along it depends on who's the president and one very good thing which has happened is that america has finally after many years of you know having uh, you know withdrawn uh, or shown indifference Uh, because unless america takes interest and unless america takes positive interest mm -hmm. uh, you know moving the peace process in the right direction uh, things are not going to move forward okay okay one one more thing here ambassador gupta and that is from india's perspective since you've served there both in israel and egypt as well how would these developments impact india well we have always taken a holistic uh, position a balanced position uh, in the region uh, we have developed uh, we have we have a traditional support for palestinian cause mm -hmm. and that has not weakened in any um, uh, manner possible in fact uh, minister of external affairs has uh, uh, again uh, reminded uh, the world that we remain committed to the palestinian cause and the palestinians have a right to live in secure you know fixed uh, boundary you know statehood but we have also in the last 26 27 years Uh, uh developed relationship with israel and has this relationship has progressed uh, 
uh, to a very significant level where we have uh, considerable uh, uh, you know exchanges with them in the defense sector uh, in the security field in trade and uh, commerce uh, in high technology areas mm -hmm. so i think this is a relationship look today uh, you don't work on ideological constraints uh, every country uh, trying to optimize its relationship with a host of countries to make sure that we can bring the maximum amount of benefits to our people. Mm -hmm. So if we have something to gain from the Gulf countries, we have, a, we have about 9 million people uh, living in the Gulf countries. So they are very important to us. We uh, get a lot of our energy supplies uh, from the Gulf countries. So the Gulf countries are extremely important. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, our relationship with Israel is also important. And I think we are doing the right thing by... Uh, developing relationship with different countries and telling them that, look, our relationship with UAE is not at the expense of Israel. Okay. So if Israel objects to our relationship with UAE, then I think it is not right for you to do so. Okay. And likewise, so we are developing relationship with all the countries and remaining committed to the principle of our, uh, you know, how we look at it. So we will, we are not abandoning our commitment to our, our, our desire to see Palestinians live in a secure and uh, you know clearly defined state okay. palestinians need a state so far i mean all these years you've reduced them to you know a stateless people which is not fair at all okay. i think the palestinians have been given a very raw deal and they must be given a state and uh, you know israel must stop its annexation of uh, palestinian territories and east jerusalem in the west bank you know what we call the green line uh, and they are they're trying to fatten the green line all of that must stop okay and okay the world is not supporting it america is not supporting it nobody is supporting okay so i think there is need for greater pressure on israel uh, to ensure that while israel's peace should not be threatened they have mm -hmm. a right to live in secure environment they must get out of the siege mentality but palestinians must also be given a respectable option okay of Statehood. Okay, so both both sides will have to make uh, the amends there, and India certainly has uh, made its stand very clear. In the past few years, we've uh, spent uh, a lot of time and energy on uh, strengthening our relations with both uh, Arab world countries as well as Israel. Uh, let me have the final question uh, to uh, Professor Pasha here as well. From India's point of view, Professor Va Pasha, how, how do you look at this the, these developments? Uh, you see, there are three points. One is until recently, the Gulf countries were looking towards Pakistan for a variety of issues, especially in the security uh, sector. Now that I think is history. Uh, uh, the Gulf countries, uh, those who have uh, offered relations and also those who have not, uh, are developing closer relations with Israel. Uh, not only in the intelligence and security field, but also openly importing weapons uh, now. Uh, so uh, that is a major development because, uh, uh, you know, the Pakistani factor had uh, bedeviled our relations with the Gulf countries. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, for quite some time, the Gulf countries have been sending signals for uh, robust uh, military defense, security, intelligence cooperation with India. Uh, so far, we have been uh, doing a few things, but uh, much more, I think, uh, is likely to happen okay. in the background of, uh, you know, uh, the common assumption by Israel and the Gulf states is that uh, the United States is not uh, anymore uh, really interested as it used to be in the Gulf of Africa. Okay. So, uh, if they can import the, the Gulf countries, they, they import the weapons from America and uh, Israel, you know, Indians also can equally respond. Uh, we have already signed defense uh, cooperation agreement with uh, Qatar, with UAE, with Saudi Arabia, with Oman. So, uh, you know, it has to be operationalized. Uh, and uh, this is a win-win situation, not only for us, but also for the Gulf countries. And we have robust relations with Israel okay. and growing relations with the United States, the military security field. Okay. So the coming years would see uh, the security cooperation, enhanced uh, intelligence cooperation, uh, 
uh, and uh, it would safeguard our core interests of uh, security of the Indian workers, uh, our oil, energy security, trade, commerce, investments, food security, and other major issues in this region. Okay, okay, there it is. Thank you so much, uh, Professor A.K. Pasha, Mr. K.B. Prasad, and Mr. Vayan Gupta for sharing your time and views uh, with uh, our viewers as well on this very important topic. So there it is all about Ibrahim Accords. We'll come back again tomorrow.